series uh, that I'm calling uh, Be Good Ground. That's the first part. And the second part is Sow Good Seed. Next week, we'll start talking about sowing good seed. And in this series, we're, we're going to talk about your life. Uh, we're going to talk about your life, and we're going to explore your life through the, the matrix of the kingdom. Some of you right now are beginning to see your life through the matrix of the kingdom as you walk your way uh, through free indeed. You're in your fourth week of that, and I honor everybody that is part of that. And you're beginning to see your life through the matrix of the kingdom of God and through the, the word of God. And my idea in this series is not to create more Christian hedonists. We got plenty of those. Self-indulged, self-centered believers who live for what they fancy as the next best thing for them. Uh, the world, uh, this country especially, needs less and less of those. Uh, uh, you know, what good is prosperity uh, if you lose your soul? Uh, what good is love if your love is wasted on the wrong object of your love? And what good is knowing the Word of God if you only uh, listen to it, but you choose not to obey or, or act upon it? Uh, today, we're talking about be good ground, and we must choose to be good ground. Uh, we must also understand how to sow good seeds for our future harvest, because whether you think you have a harvest in your future or not, you do, and it'll be weeds or it'll be from the seeds that you sow in your life. And so to today, I, I want to look at Matthew 13. Uh, Jesus told his message often in story form. And I need you to hear this as we begin today, that the Lord tells his stories in the Gospels, uh, his parables, for, for two real reasons. The first is to make clearer, everyone say clearer, the Word of God to those who have already determined to believe it. They came and said, I'm ready to hear what Jesus wants to say. I'm ready to listen and I'm ready to receive the word from Jesus himself. And the second reason he teaches in a parable is to obscure, everybody say obscure, the word of God from those who have determined already in their heart to reject it. And so we read Matthew 13 and 1. Later that same day, Jesus left the house and sat beside the lake. A large crowd soon gathered around him. And so he got in a boat and then he sat there and taught as the people stood on the shore. I think Mark made a funny about that the last few weeks. The teacher sat and the people stood. How, how, Y'all would really want short, short sermons if that were the case, right? <laughs> And Jesus tells, uh, he told many stories in the form of parables and such as this one. So this begins, listen, a farmer went out to plant some seeds and as he scattered them across his field, some seeds fell on a footpath and the birds came and ate them. Other seeds fell on shallow soil with underlying rock and the seeds sprouted quickly and became the, the uh, and the sprout, and the seeds sprouted quickly because the soil was shallow but the plants soon wilted under the hot sun, and since they didn't have any deep roots, they died. Other seeds fell among thorns that grew up and choked out the tender plants. Still other seeds fell on fertile soil, and they produced a crop that was 30, 60, and even 100 times as much as had been planted. And then he says these interesting words, anyone with ears to hear should listen and understand. Anyone with a heart to hear should listen and they should begin to understand. Jesus explains this parable. Some parables he doesn't explain, but, but this one he does. Skip down with me to verse 18. Now listen to the explanation of the parable about the farmer planting seeds. The seed that fell on the footpath represents those who hear the message about the kingdom and don't understand it, and then the evil one comes and and literally, in the Greek, that would probably mean doesn't want to understand it. 
chooses not to understand it. And then the evil one comes and snatches away the seed that was planted in their hearts. The seed on the rocky soil represents those who hear the message and immediately they receive it with joy. But since they don't have deep roots, they don't last long and they fall away as soon as they have problems or are persecuted for believing God's word. And the seed that fell among the thorns represents those who hear God's word, but all too quickly the message is crowded out by the worries of this life and the lure of wealth, so no fruit is produced. And the seed that fell on good soil represents those who truly hear and understand God's word, and it produced a harvest of 30, 60, or even 100 times as much as had been Planted. Uh, perhaps uh, other than the word of God itself, there is no book which has influenced Christianity throughout history, uh, throughout the years as the book Pilgrim's Progress. Uh, I know that it's probably not so popular today, but up until this last generation, Pilgrim's Progress was often required reading. Uh, it was especially in universities and Christian schools. Pilgrim's Progress is the analogy of the Christian life as John Bunyan saw it. It wasn't a perfect analogy, but it was insightful nonetheless. The story shares the, the ups and the downs as we travel the Christian life. And yet John Bunyan himself uh, in his own life is an illustration of the fact of how powerful God's word actually is. Uh, before his conversion, John Bunyan was referred to as the blasphemous tinker of Bedford. Uh, he was a godless man. In, uh, he was the most godless man in the village in which he lived. He was so hard-hearted that, and ungodly that, uh, that no Christian had any hope for him at all that he would ever become a Christian. But one day, somehow... He heard the story of the sower who went forth to sow. And, and these very words seized his heart. And he said to himself, even the devil knows that if a man believes the word, he will be saved. And so he believed it and he was saved. And as Paul Harvey says, now you know the, the rest yeah. of the story. Good day? Anyway, all right. Uh, I aged myself there. All right. So here's Jesus. He has a large crowd. He gets on a boat. He sits down. They stand up. And he starts telling kingdom stories. He is, uh, he is helping people to interact with a new way uh, of living. And, and as we can see uh, in this parable, there are three sections, uh, three things of importance. First of all, there is the sower. Secondly, there is the seed. And thirdly, there are the soils or the, good, or the ground. In fact... Uh, the two are almost incidental to the last one. It is the soils that are the main part of this parable. The, the sower in this illustration, in this story, is the Lord himself. And, and in the parable that follows this one, we're told that the, the sower is the, the son of God. He is the one who is sowing the seed. And, and to understand this parable, you have to understand the picture of the sower in the life and times of Jesus. In that time, they did not plant their crops as we do today. And in fact, uh, what they did was they would take a bag of seed and they would begin to broadcast it and they would throw it. They would throw it over their shoulder. They would throw it out in front of them. They would throw it to the left. They would throw it to the right, and uh, they would just continue to broadcast it across the ground. Matter of fact, they didn't even usually cultivate the ground. In some areas, uh, they would broadcast the seed, and then they would have others come and come back behind them and begin to cultivate and scratch it into the ground, if you would, so that it had a chance to stay there. That, that's what uh, preaching the Word of God or teaching the Word of God actually is. It's just scattering it. It's just broadcasting it today. Uh, it's just this letting the word of God go forward. Today I'm preaching to, to every one of you and each one of you is choosing whether you're going to receive the word of God 
or you're going to resist the word of God. In this parable, Jesus is the sower and, and the seed is the word of God. And uh, it is the word of the kingdom in Mark and Luke that tell this story. They call it the word of God as well. And the seed is the word of God for a number of reasons. First of all, like natural seed, God's word has life in itself. It has life in itself. Secondly, like natural seed, the word of God produces fruit. Thirdly, the word will not return to him void, but it will accomplish the thing where it has been sent. Another one is like natural seed. The word of God has been planted and cultivated and watered in order to produce. Another thing like natural seed, the word of God is powerful. Uh, we know that natural seed is powerful. Many of us have seen some unbelievable things in our lives, flowers growing up in the middle of sidewalks, trees busting up in the middle of pavement. What happened? Somehow, some way, a little seed got some moisture and it began to sprout and it began to take root and it began to grow up right through the concrete. How? That's the power of the seed. Listen very closely. The word of God is like that. Just give it some space in your life and watch it grow. Amen. We talked a few weeks ago about Augustine, one of the great church fathers. It, it was a simple seed from the word of God that brought about his conversion. Uh, one day he was in the garden. He was miserably sick, according to his own testimony, miserably sick in his own sin. He had realized that everything he had done in life, everything he had reached for in his life had brought him no fulfillment, had brought him no satisfaction, had brought him no hope. It, it, it lasted for just a season, just for a moment. And ultimately he found himself sick at heart, and, and he seemed to, to hear a voice saying to him, take and read. And there was a copy of the scriptures nearby, and he opened it up. He just opened it up like I recommend you don't do, but Augustine did. He just flipped open the scripture, and it came open to Romans chapter 13. And these words began to speak to him. He read them, not in rioting or drunkenness, not in chambering or wantonness, not in strife and envying, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. And Augustine read no further. The seed of the word of God, the seed of God's word had been planted in his heart. And right there he fell to his knees and he confessed his faith in Jesus Christ. And, and there was nobody there to tell him and there was no preacher there to lead him through a prayer. But, but this, <coughs> the seed... <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. I might. The seed. Everyone say the seed. Of the word of God. Changed his heart immediately. Amen. And he was greatly influenced. And, and throughout the course of Christian history. He's been a, a great influence. Oh what power is in the seed of God's word. I think of my friend David Conine. I never led him to the Lord. I never had that moment where we, we, you know, prayed with one another and he accepted Jesus in that moment. David, back in the 80s, really seriously considered himself to be an anarchist. He would, he would put the anarchist symbol everywhere he went. He would put it on his locker. He put it on his notebooks. He would spray paint it on the side of the school. He would get suspended. David and I were in a, in a DECA class, a, business, a young businessman's class together, though. And David, he is kind of a hilarious guy back in the 80s. He had the mullet, you know, business on top and party in the back. And, and uh, he just, one of those guys. Uh, just, but somehow we made a friendship, and I invited him to a Bible study. He had never studied the Bible in his entire life. And I invited him to a Bible study at our little church. And there was probably about 25 people that night. And my pastor faithfully 
taught the scriptures that night. David and I, uh, I got, uh, my mom dropped David off at the house and, and, and we would talk throughout the years, just the next couple of years. He never came to a place of faith in Christ while we were in high school. But today, Dave, this morning, David Conine is getting ready to teach and preach at Calvary Chapel, Spokane Valley. Yeah. And he would tell me years later when Facebook caught up, he said, Kevin, that moment that I went to that Bible study, something began to happen in my life. I heard the word of God and it began to do a work in my life. Funny story, you've seen Jesus Revolution, Chuck Smith's story there. Maybe you've seen that movie. David actually was led to the Lord by Chuck Smith. His sister was getting married to one of Chuck Smith's pastors, and Chuck Smith said, David, have you ever come to a relationship with Jesus Christ? And David said, no, but I believe. And David received Jesus that day. Amen? Listen, can I just cut to the chase this morning? We cannot afford to overlook or underestimate the power of God's word in our life. We must teach it, we must preach it, we must read it, we must seek to understand it, and we must live it. Our children actually need the word of God. Amen. I'm grateful for our children's ministry. Uh, We've got a, a... uh, the report is a ton of young uh, preteens today in our children's ministry. I praise God for that. I'm grateful for our youth. Matter of fact, Drew right now is uh, taking our youth through the Bible. He's teaching them the word of God. Uh, listen, listen, it's so important. Uh, I was just at a ministerial group last week and the talk was uh, and, and we had a, just some a time where we could have a brief discussion. And the talk was about people deconstructing their faith, walking away from a lifelong faith. And then the statistics came before us. And it, it was like a gut punch that we're losing 71% of our 18-year-olds After they move away from home and get out of their church culture, we're losing them. They're no longer professing to be Christians or they're deconstructing their faith. And that was a gut punch. And then somebody said, let me read to you, though, what George Barna did when he interviewed the 29% who stayed. And this is what they said, the 29% that stayed. 84% said the reason they stayed is that one of the reasons they stayed is that they had a powerful personal encounter with the Holy Spirit. 85% said that they had two or more mentors in their life, spiritual mentors in their life. 76% said that they went on a meaningful missions trip. 94%, you think spiritual gifts are important, 94% said that they were taught and allowed to use their their spiritual gifts early as teenagers. They were taught and allowed to use their spiritual gifts. And here's the last one, 86% said that they came from a strong Bible teaching church. They didn't just highlight scriptures, but they taught the scriptures. They taught the scriptures in their fullness and in their power. Listen, I'm here to say the days of the church being a social club need to be over. The days of trying to win the world with worldly wisdom needs to be over. When Paul said, I became all things to all men, that has been grossly misunderstood and mis- uh, 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 misrepresented. There is something that we possess in our hands that has power to capture the heart, and it is the word of God. Be good ground. Say be good ground. The sower is Jesus. The sower is also the one or can be the one who is preaching. But the seed that has any power is the word of God. But that leads us to the soil, the ground. Let me tell you, the soil and the ground is just real simple. That's your heart. And your heart is your mind, your will, and your emotions. Let me say that again. Your heart, 
biblically is your mind, your will, and your emotions. Your cognitive reasoning, your willful decisions, and your emotional attachment or passion to the cognitive reasoning and your willful decisions. You love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength. We have to be good ground. In other words, we have to choose to have a right heart, to have a heart that wants to hear, have a heart that is open to receive, have a heart that wants to be taught, have a heart that is ready not only to hear, but to do. And that's good ground. Four types of soil are seen here uh, in Matthew 13. The first is the, the footpath soil. Maybe in your Bible, it's the wayside soil. It's the, the birds. It's the soil that sits on top and it never takes root. And the birds gobble up the seed. If you've ever flown over our country, uh, if you've ever flown over the Midwest especially, then you've noticed how carefully and systematic our, our, our farmlands are, are laid out. But that's not how it was in Jesus' time. In ancient Palestine, it wasn't organized that way. There were no fences there to separate the land. The land was sort of organized as it grew up. And so there were sections of land that belonged to you and sections that belonged to me. And the only thing that separated it was the footpaths, which were about three feet in width. And, and when they, they went between the sections of land. And what Jesus is telling the disciples was that sometimes when the sower sows, it lands uh, on some ground that isn't ready for it. It's landing on some ground that doesn't want to receive. And the Bible also tells us that the birds that came and ate represent the devil himself. And, and when Jesus is saying this, sometimes the word of God falls on calloused hearts. The seed never goes down to the heart. It just lays there on top. And when that happens, it's only there for a short time. And then Satan comes and he steals it away and it's gone. And it, it's just like the birds in the parable. What, what kind of person is a callous-hearted person? Here's a man or a woman who is unconcerned. The Bible says that he understands it not. Or again, literally it means he doesn't want to understand it. He has no desire to understand it. And the fault is not in the seed. And the, the fault is definitely not with the sower. But the fault is the heart of the man. The hard-hearted ones are people who are indifferent to the word of God. In fact, they, they may hear the word of God even on a regular basis, but it never touches them. They're listeners, but they're not hearers. Their seed is, the seed is broadcast, but their hard heart keeps them from receiving. You ever noticed our tough desert ground around here that hasn't been cultivated? You ever seen it just pour hard rain and literally watch with your own eyeballs the ground reject the rain? Yeah, that's the scene here. Something has come to refresh you. Something has come to restore you. Something has come to transform your life. It's, it's not this sermon. It's the power of the word of God that has come to transform your life. And yet if you're not in a position or a place to receive, it just bounces off. It hears the word of God and yet it deflects the word of God. And now that seed is laying there, Satan snatches it up. He gets them distracted or doubting. And, and, and that's the first heart, the callous heart. And in the second kind of soil, it's the shallow soil with underlying rock. Uh, it, it's a layer of thin soil with limestone in Jesus' day in that area of Palestine where there's limestone just underneath 
the surface. And that's the, the casual heart. And read how Jesus interprets it again in verses 20 and 21. This is what he says. The seed on the rocky soil represents those who hear the message and immediately receive it with joy. But since they don't have deep roots, they don't last long. They fall away as soon as they have problems or are persecuted or they have pressure for believing the word of God. And what you have here is a thin layer of soil. To the untrained eye, it may look great, but underneath it's hard stone. There's enough soil to start, but because the rock is right beneath the soil, the roots have no place to go, and so they begin to go up, and, and the plant is frustrated, and it ultimately pushes itself out of the ground. There's an immediate explosion of foliage and expression of fruit and things are going to happen. Have you ever seen somebody have an incredible moment with God and you think, wow, they just had a great moment. What a wonderful plant that is, right? This is going to be marvelous. But then the sun comes out. And the sun begins to do its work on the plant because there's no root deep down where they can get moisture. The plant uh, the, plant, the plant begins to fold up and the sun dries it up and the next thing you know, they're, they're withered and dead. Ever notice anybody who had an explosive conversion, then a year later you wonder if they actually had an experience at all? There's no evidence. What happened? The seed was sown in the heart and it was received with joy. It was received with emotion But there was no genuine conversion. There was no depth. There was no roots. And when the sun or difficulty or or a life or persecution or pressures came because of their conversion and they were called to give an account of their conversion, they, they did not have the evidence in their own life for it. This name doesn't resonate with many of you, but for some of you it will. His name was Larry Flint. He was a publisher of a terrible, godless magazine. And he got saved. And he went on every Christian broadcast he could. He even went on CNN with Larry King and told his testimony of his Christian faith. And uh, that lasted six months. And six months after that, Larry King then went on every station he possibly could and renounced his conversion experience and literally his words not mine it was the stupidest thing i had ever done Hmm. let me cut to it i'm grateful and thankful for every hand raised when we give an altar call when we ask you to come to a place of faith in jesus christ i'm literally i I literally get goosebumps and I'm grateful and thankful if it's one or if it's 25 or it's 100. But the fact of the matter is what's happening in that moment, I can see it and I see your hand and I'm going to believe and agree with you. But the only one that knows what's happening in that moment is you and Jesus Christ. You and the Lord and Savior himself at that moment know what is happening in your heart. And so when we preach, there's going to be people that will come and say, oh man, you know what? That's what I want, PK. And Jesus says they receive it with joy. It's an emotional response. Maybe they cry, but but they don't make a faith decision to say today in my life, I am turning around. I am repenting. I was walking in this direction. I was full of myself, self-rule, self-sufficiency, self-justification. I thought I was good within myself, but I realized I am not. In me, there is no good thing. And so today I'm turning around and I'm not just asking Jesus to say, Save me from hell, but I'm asking Jesus to save me from myself, and I want to follow him as my Lord and as my Savior, and I want to follow him with everything that I have. That 
is a decision of faith. Number three, the ground is thorn ridden. I call this cluttered ground, right? Cluttered ground. Listen, wherever you broadcast, sow seed, you're going to sow in an area where weeds can grow too, where thorns can grow too. How many know weeds like a lot of the same things plants do? This is ground that plants could grow. This is ground that plants should grow, that fruit can grow. If plants and fruit were a priority. Yeah. Cluttered lives. Cluttered lives. People with cluttered hearts must deal with the weeds. It's interesting, in the age of the prosperity gospel, Jesus says, listen, the thorns in this story are the worries of life and the lure of riches. <laughs> Mark would say the lust for other things. I want you to hear that again. The worries of life, the lure of riches, and the lust for other things. A lot of Christians live cluttered lives. But you're, you're not hard-hearted like the first. You're not just overly emotional like the second. You, 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 you put your emotions into it, but you're not just doing this based on emotions. You, you, you're here, you're in it, but you have cluttered lives. Your heart is divided. And you come to church for the connections and the status, and you come for the self-help, and you come for the wrong motives, Right? In the U.S. church, there's, there's a lot of this. In our culture, we've created this. They'll be here if it's convenient. They'll, they'll do what they can for the church, but they do what they can to witness, but their priority really isn't him or this. It's them. And they get distracted by worries, and they chase after riches. And, they, and listen to me, riches aren't wrong. <laughs> I think my pastor used to say this all the time. It's okay to have money as long as money doesn't have you. And follow this. The three enemies that are found in Mark and Matthew. It's the devil, the birds. The enemy of the second soil is the flesh, right? They can't take the persecution of the sun. And the third enemy of the soil is the world system and its pleasures and its riches and its cares. They are the real enemies when you sow the word of God. The word or the world, excuse me, the flesh and the devil have always been the enemies of God's people. And God's people who refuse, and, and, and God's people, but not only God's people and the people, I should say, who refuse to be saved. Yeah, that's always the enemy, the world, the flesh, and the devil. But the last ground is what we all can be. Say, I can be good ground. Yeah. I know there's friends of mine who theologically say, no, some of you cannot. It's already been predetermined that you're not good ground, and you'll never be good ground. I don't have time to go into that. That's not what I read in the scripture. <laughs> Say to yourself, I can be good ground. I believe every person in this room can be saved. I believe every person in this room can produce the fruit of salvation and conversion in their life through the power of the Holy Spirit and the seed of the word of God. I believe every person can have an enduring faith. I know statistics from this parable. There's a lot of people that say, well, only 25%, only 20. But I don't think Jesus is sharing statistics in this parable. Jesus isn't trying to get preachers to feel good about themselves if only 25% of the crowd listen. No, Jesus is reaching for the entire crowd that is standing on the shore and said you can have a calloused heart or you can have a casual heart or you can have a cluttered heart or you can have a committed heart a heart that says yes to the kingdom of God he was challenging hearts and I believe that every single person in this room every single person listening on the radio every single person watching online can be saved today through Jesus Christ. 
I still believe the words, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes on him will be saved. They will not perish, but they'll have everlasting life. Amen. How many believe that today? Whosoever. Whosoever. Any whosoever's in the room this morning. That's who we are. If we would believe, I don't think there's a heart that cannot, by the power of the Holy Spirit through faith, not be changed to good ground. I believe your life can be fertile ground for the word to produce fruit in your life. See, you got to understand this. You can't, religion teaches you to produce the religious fruit. That's not the story here either. What produces the fruit? The seed. The seed produces the fruit. The word of God produces the transformation in your life. The word of God produces the next in your life. You don't produce it. God's word produces it. But what's your part? I want to be good ground. Ready to receive the seed of the word of God. I want to have a heart that wants... I may not understand everything you're saying today, PK. But I want a heart that will patiently pursue after God. And let the word of God grow in my life. I'm not who I was at 14. Yeah, thank the Lord. (laughs) What you're seeing is 41 years now. Of patiently pursuing the word of God. And allowing the word of God to move in my life. Amen. Amen. The fruit's not the works of religion. But the results of the seed. Did you hear me? The fruit is not the works of religion. But the result of the seed. Okay. The word, the seed will produce harvest in your life. A life-giving transformation harvest. So I'm going to make this statement, and then I'm going to ask you to just walk these last few minutes with me. You don't get good to get God. You get God to get good. It's real simple. I'm done preaching. But I'm going to take a few minutes, and I'm going to plead. And uh, it's okay. It's okay, honey. I promise it's all right. I raised six, so this doesn't throw me off at all. I promise. Yeah. I might make some of you nervous, but listen to me. And maybe if you could just do your best now to not think about the person next to you. You might even want to close your eyes while I go over this next part and plead with you as a pastor. As your friend. As somebody who prays for you and your families. Listen, the proof of salvation is not listening to the word. Proof of salvation is not emotionally responding to the word. Proof of salvation isn't even in miracles performed. For there'll be those in the last days that will look at him and say, Lord, Lord, did we not cast out demons and perform miracles in your name? The proof of salvation is in the fruit that the seed produces in your life. Jesus said, you will know them by their fruit. And if there, is, if there isn't any fruit, there, there isn't any life. Each of these soil scenarios had some form of connection to the word. But the good soil, the transformed heart brought forth fruit. Some brought forth a hundred. Some brought forth sixty. Some brought forth thirty. In verse 23, Jesus said, The seed that fell on good ground represents those who truly hear and under." Stand, they receive God's word, and God's word 
produces something in their life. If Is the soil of your heart ready to receive? Not a pastor's word, but the word of God. Pat Mahomes and Brock Purdy are going to throw some amazing passes today. But if nobody's on the other end to receive, nothing's gained. God called me to preach. As a pastor, I'm patient. As a pastor, I sow along with the Holy Spirit. As a pastor, I got to stay faithful to the, the task and the text. Uh, no, no new way of just doing things will replace the power of God's word in your life. I, no, 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 nothing, nothing. No, we could, we could throw up a million lights and fog machines and, 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 and do brilliant colors and, and do half my sermon on video and whatever you want to do. There's nothing. That will replace the power of the Word of God. So we continue to preach and teach the Word. So I say this with soberness. I say this without religious condemnation. I, but somebody needs to hear this. Because to summarize the second message of this parable. Is that those who have true salvation are not just hearers. But they have proof. I'm not here to unsettle your faith, but I am not afraid to challenge it. Because if your faith is not being challenged, then it needs to be. Paul said, examine yourselves to see if your faith is genuine. Test yourselves. Surely you know that Jesus Christ is among you. If not, you have failed the test of genuine faith. Peter would say these words, and I want you to hear them. I'm just going to read them. I'm not going to comment on them. By his divine power, God has given us everything we need for living a godly life. We've received all of this by coming, get this, to know him, the one who has called us to himself by means of his marvelous glory and excellence. And because of his glory and excellence, he has given us great and precious promises. Sorry. These are the promises that enable you to share his divine nature and escape the world's corruption caused caused by human desires. In all of this, make every effort to respond to God's promises. Supplement your faith with generous provision of moral excellence and moral excellence with knowledge and knowledge with self-control and self-control with patient endurance and patient endurance with godliness and godliness with brotherly affection and brotherly affection with love for everyone. And the more you grow like this, the more you grow like this, the more productive and useful you will be in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But those who fail to develop this way are short-sighted or blind, forgetting that they have been cleansed from their old sins. So, dear brothers and sisters, I want you to hear this. Work hard to prove that you really are among those who God has called and chosen. Do these things and you will never fall away. Listen to me. The difference between faith and And trusting in the righteousness of God. Or there is a difference between faith and trusting in the righteousness of God. And a smug sense of complacency that some people have. People who say everything's all right because you know what? Way back there a long time ago I said a few special words. But there's never been a change in their life. There's no evidence that Jesus Christ is involved in their lives and they're walking through life with a lifestyle that does not match up with the word of God and the transformation that the word of God desires to bring in their life. Now I understand, yes, Christians can be saved and choose to live carnally. Yeah. To their own detriment, to their own hurt, to their own pain, Corinth and countless other examples in the scripture prove it. I'm talking about people who resist the word of God and willfully resist being changed by it, but still somehow claim to have faith in Christ. When Jesus Christ comes into your life or into my life, there is absolutely, and there's absolutely no difference in the way that I am now than the way I was before, then that's not the way I understand salvation from this 
the word of God. Jesus didn't come to give you the life that you had, and Jesus didn't come to give you the life you currently have. He came to give you life and new life and more abundant life. And we shouldn't have the Holy Spirit living within us and, and, and decide we can live a filthy, defiled life with no, and I want you to hear these words, with no conscience about it. Christians are not sinless. When they stumble, when they slide, when they stubbornly try to hold on to their sin, it bothers them. They know when they've grieved the Holy Spirit. And they are quick, sometimes quicker than others, to repent. Christians are miserable sinners. What used to bring satisfaction doesn't come close to bringing the satisfaction it used to bring. Miserable sinners. Not perfect. You know what John says? They're not characterized by habitual sin. And and he said if you continue to live in habitual sin, there's only two reasons. You don't know him and you don't understand him. Oh, what's what's the way out of my habitual sin? Self-determination? What's the way out of my habitual sin and my shortcomings? Figuring out how to do it in my own self-sufficiency? No. Go to him. Get in relationship with him. Get in a relationship with his word and understand him. Is what John says. You know... uh, I battled this week, or I battled for a short time, not this week, this week I came to the end of the battle, but for a while now, something happened in a a particular relationship in my life, and I won't go into the details, and it made me upset, really mad, hurt, offended, disgusted. Um, and I began to carry it around. And uh, I made an inner vow. And I made some decisions. And I justified my inner vow. And I justified my decisions. But that little spot of my heart that I decided I'm going to take control of, the Holy Spirit just kept. How you doing, Kev? Good to see you today, too. Thank you. Thank you for your worship. Thank you for asking my guidance. I'd like to point your heart and mind to this little spot over here. Oh, I understand. I understand. I, I really, I really do agree with you about loving this person and loving this situation. I really do agree with you about that, but But, you know, as I was thinking, according to the word, I'm going to, I don't have to, and I think I did that for about six weeks, just, mm, mm. but finally, the other day, it happened real funny, funny, it happened listening to a worship song as I'm driving down the road, my heart finally got in a soft place. Where I could look at that and not just forgive what happened over here, but ask for forgiveness myself. And say, Father, wow. <laughs> 41 years and I can still get messed up. Yeah, I, I don't want that. And you know what happened there? I didn't just have a moment of prayer and uh, have a moment of forgiveness for the person and a moment of forgiveness for myself I immediately I know I was driving don't don't father forgive me for that I immediately sent a voice text I didn't look down and text (laughs) Siri send a text to so and so and I took action immediately to make it all work together (laughs) 
Christians aren't sinless, but the scripture says when we do sin, we can come to him and we can confess our sin and he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Amen. Ask yourself, are you in the faith today? Let me ask you another question. If you were indicted for being a Christian, is there enough evidence to convict you? I know I'm confronting, and many came in here wanting comforting. <laughs> but I promise you, I'm not talking about perfection. I'm, talking, I'm not talking about producing in a religious way. I'm asking you a real question today. Have you come to a place of faith in Jesus Christ? And if you come to a place where you aren't just hoping to secure your future place in heaven, but you have come to a place in Jesus Christ where you say, here I am and I need a total transformation in my life. And I know it's not going to happen overnight because plants don't sprout up overnight. I know it's not going to happen in just a moment. But Father, over the process of time, I'm going to trust you. And when I look back a year from now or five years from now or... For 10 years from now, I am going to have everything that you wanted me to have because your word produced in my life. Amen. Stand.